Uh, my name is Jason Snook, uh, SE here for Quorum, calling you in, calling in today from uh, lovely and sunny uh, downtown Eugene, Oregon. We are just kind of joking a minute ago about this is probably one of the worst winters we've had up here, and we're all looking for places to either move to or find some place to vacate and uh, get some sunshine. So that being said, we're going to try and keep this light. Uh, definitely would like some questions at the end of this. Um, this is one of those topics uh, talking about regulatory uh, compliance and data protection. You know, it could be really boring. We could turn this into a really dry government-related discussion, but I'm going to do my best to kind of keep it light, keep it uh, uh, very straightforward, and, and I'm hoping to generate some, some questions about this. So very quickly, a little background about myself. If you want to find me, check me out at uh, Quorum. You can uh, email me at jason.snook at quorum.net. Uh, I'm a father of uh, two little boys that keep me super active uh, when I'm not out uh, keep trying to keep up with them on the snowboards out here in the in the northwest. I'm trying to find a great place to ride my bike someplace out in the woods. So that's a little bit about me. Don't want to drone on about that a little for, for too long. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? So the main things uh, that I want to talk about are uh, what is compliance? Let me move this screen here. Um, what are some of the, uh, the most common um, regulatory compliance um, that we hear about? Now, this, is, this could definitely be the acronym SOUP, as we call it in the Air Force, and we're going to try and steer clear of that. Um, we're, I've come up with something called the Pillars of Compliance, and you can insert your own uh, movie theme music there if you want, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some expectations that customers have to not only pass their audits, but also... Um, what their internal expectations are as a infrastructure or as an organization. And then we'll, we'll get right down to it. We're going to talk about what I think some of the, the, most, <laughs> the most common best practices are to get you both to, to pass your audit and meet those internal expectations. So here are some of the, the big ones. So how do we gather this, uh, the information for today's uh, webinar? Pretty simple. Uh, I work for a company that's in the realm of data protection. We have a lot of customers who have to pass audits and who use us uh, for two things. They use us to get compliant with whatever regulations they're supposed to be compliant with. They also use us to um, uh, protect their data, protect their systems, ensure availability, uptime, all those great buzzwords. So we went to them, we started asking them, okay, what is it that you actually have to pass? What, what, what does your audit look like? And what, what, are, they, what are these uh, regulations actually telling you to do? Here's some of them that I'm sure most people on the phone have, have heard of before, PCI. PCI is one of those things that if you transact um, uh, credit card processing over the phone or in person, you probably know about PCI. Anytime you go to Best Buy, Best Buy is one of those you know, paramount PCI audit customers that have to come out and they have to make sure that they secure the transaction in flight, they secure the, uh, the customer's private and confidential information, they, do, they don't let it out. <clears throat> HIPAA is one of those things. It's all about healthcare. It's all about making sure that the medical records kept in an EHR, uh, electronic health record system, make sure that no one else, people who are not supposed to see it, um, don't see it. You, the last thing you want to do is go down and get a prescription for Tylenol and let, have everyone else out in the world know that you are now taking Tylenol. So HIPAA is one of those things that it, it, from the world of compliance and regulation, this is one of those things that has teeth. We're going to talk about, we're going to highlight a couple of the regs that um, have cost some customers some serious dollars last year and then going forward, talk about maybe what the fines and regulations are going to look like going forward. Um, Graham Leach Bliley, it's one of those things where um, this is going to, talking about the, the private financial information. This is going to stipulate that financial inst institutions, they have to implement security programs to protect information. They have to do this. Sarbanes-Oxley is one of those um, you know, one of those stories that, or one of those regulations that came out shortly after Enron and shortly after a bunch of financial companies cheated a lot of really good people. So, so the SOX compliance is all about keeping data for a long time. So if you do something bad, we can recover that data. You're forced to keep that data. We can recover it. So we can, we can uh, hold people who are accountable liable. SOX is all about holding data for a long time. Now, FISMA. FISMA is one of those... Um, it stands for the Federal Information Security Management Act. This is one of those interesting acts that is actually saying um, uh, government agencies and people who do, do business with the government and who are subject to FISMA compliance, they have to protect their systems, their assets, their data against, get this, against natural or man-made threats. Now, FISMA is one of these all-encompassing compliance rules that says, 
if you are collecting data and you're and you've got to stay in compliance with FISMA, it's got to be secure. You can't lose it. You have to have systems that are resilient. You have to have a business continuity plan. You got to make sure that if you are hosting systems for the public or the or or an entity to access, that system has to be online regardless of a natural or a man-made threat. So FISMA is where a lot of the rules actually come from. Uh, it, it turns out that um, a lot of other regulatory compliance offices within our own government look to FISMA for guidelines and look to them for ideas on how to better uh, make sure that people stay compliant with protecting data and not only protecting data, making sure it doesn't go public, making sure that the systems that people rely on are always online. Now FINRA, I, I, I dropped FINRA in here because it's, a, it's, it's actually, it's technically it's non-government, it's, it's, um, it's funny, it's a not-for-profit agency, however, FINRA has the deepest, the sharpest teeth out here. If you go against FINRA and if you um, do something that they don't like and that you're out of compliance, you will get fined millions of dollars. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So the two on this list that, I, in my opinion, from my own research and what our customers have told us, the two on here that have the biggest teeth are HIPAA and FINRA. Now, there's some other ones that probably people haven't, haven't talked about or haven't learned about, or, or maybe these are, these are new to you. And again, I'm not trying to throw a bunch of government acronym soup on you, but uh, the Expedited Funds Availability Act. Um, this is an act that states, again, if you um, are involved with bank and commerce, and if you are holding deposits for other banks, the systems that are there to hold those deposits and to collect that um, financial information, they have to be online. So it's interesting, the Expedited Funds Availability Act states that companies who are in this field have to have business continuity plans, they have to not only have them planned out, they have to test them, and the audit process is very, very strict in that you, they have to come out and they have to demonstrate if, your, if data center A goes down, I can immediately fail over to data center B and no one knows the difference. So this act is actually um, has, is what has driven a lot of innovation in the uh, backup and data protection world. Uh, the Health Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. That is an absolute uh, mouthful. Let's just call it high tech. Uh, it's all about keeping data private. And there's also a clause in there, and not only about keeping um, patient data private, not letting it get out to the world. Uh, there's a fair amount of technology that's written into this act that says, the availability of an EHR is paramount, meaning if you're a hospital and you have decided to go to an electronic health record system, you have to make sure that it is available. Pretty common sense for why you have to have it available, and, and we can even talk, we can even, even throw out some examples where it has become unavailable and because customers uh, have had to roll back the paper check-in and, and things like that. If, your EH, if the EHR is not available and you go in for your appointment at noon on a Tuesday and they have no idea who you are or who, who, who you're supposed to go see or what your drug history is or what you're there for, what, what treatment you're there for, obviously that is a problem. So if you are running an EHR, you, most likely you have a high-tech representative there um, working you towards uh, becoming compliant, making sure that your electronic record system is always available. Um, they also talk about this term, uh, this clause called the meaningful use of secure EHR. This is really interesting. This basically says that, okay, your EHR is up and running. The data is um, secured. Uh, the customer or, or um, patient data is not going to go out to the public. Now, how can you meaningfully use this EHR? And it goes into all these other stipulations about what you can and cannot do with um, patient's records, meaning who can you send it to? What sort of documentation do you have to have before you send it to that person? So high tech is, we, we hear all the time about HIPAA because it's got a lot of teeth. However, this high tech, this act, is actually what spawned um, a lot of the HIPAA regulations. Another one to talk about is where do we get our power from? How about our public uh, municipalities? Um, the NERC, the North American Electric uh, Reliability Corporation. I threw this out here because when we think about Cyber defenses, and, and we think about cyber threats, power is amongst the premier of a lot of people in our company. If we can't keep our power grid online, we're obviously going to have a pretty bad day. So the NERC is there. They come out with almost quarterly assessments of uh, power grids and power utility stations. 
um, talking about how they are or how they are not successfully um, uh, doing, the be doing the best they can to prevent a cyber attack. So the NERC is really interesting in that they take the security of our electricity and our electrical grid uh, probably more seriously than, than some of the, the grid owners themselves. Um, so what they talk about is physical security of cyber systems. They talk about um, the backup and the disaster recovery planning and availability as being one of the top um, goals of NERC. Um, the other thing they talk about is how to successfully do a vulnerability assessment. Um, they talk a fair amount about how to do how to audit. Um, so within these three that we're seeing here, we're seeing um, acts that are saying, hey, you got to keep your data secure. You got to keep your systems online. You're going to have to uh, run an audit and or uh, backup disaster recovery testing. And some of the ones that we talked about before are you have to hold data for a long time. So we're kind of starting to see a trend here as, as we're talking to our existing customers who have to comply by these. Um, but before we jump into the, to, to some of the best practices, there's, um, under my own research, what I found was an organization called GAL. GAL is Government Accountability Office. Now, Government Accountability Office, they do way more than data security, okay? This is more or less the think tank that, that uh, um, drives a lot of innovation. Um, I will call this, I was in the Air Force for years and years, and one of, the, one of the terms we had was good idea fairy. The gal is the good idea fairy. There's a bunch of guys sitting there saying, saying you know what would be a really good idea is if we encrypted all data at rest on our backup systems. Or we said that um, this particular organization in our government should have a backup plan or should, be, or should keep their systems online. The gal does that. They fund this research on the best way to secure data, prevent cyber terrorism, prevent outages of critical uh, infrastructure and systems within our own government. Um, they do this research, they fund this research, that research in turn becomes the next good idea regulation that uh, companies are forced to follow. So uh, in your free time, in all your free time in this world, check out the GAO. They, they actually do some pretty interesting work and they, they publish all of their findings uh, for the public to look at. So that being said, what, what are the people on the other side of the pond doing? Um, this is an interesting time for the EU, obviously, because of uh, the, the Brexit talk. But before Brexit was an issue, they came out, they have been working on a, um, an updated, uh, what, what they call the General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, think of this as the U United States version of regulatory compliance um, times 10. Okay? They are doing, uh, with the General Data Protection Regulation um, over in the EU, they are doing what, do, what we are doing, which means they're, they're forcing companies to, who hold private sensitive data, they're forcing them to secure it, to encrypt it, to make sure the systems are online, and then there's penalties if you break those, those promises, essentially. But they're going way beyond that. They are saying now, and this, I believe, starts up in 2018, they're saying that any company that does business in the EU or serves customers in the EU has to comply with the general, the, the GDPR. This means that the data processor and the data controllers both have to comply, and if either one of them doesn't comply, both of them are at risk for being sued. So this is quite a bit different than how we do it, right? It's a little tricky for us, the consumer, to go out and sue uh, FINRA or su sue someone who is compliant with FINRA. More likely, FINRA is going to apply some sort of a fine to an organization like, so let's say, Wells Fargo when they made the news a couple months ago for, for what they did. FINRA is responsible for busting them. We, the consumer, don't really have a ton of power to do that. Well, over in the EU, it's totally different. The GDPR will, will sanction a fine as well as allow a class action lawsuit from us, us, the consumers, to go after people who allow my private and confidential information to get shared or get stolen or distributed because they didn't follow uh, the policies and the compliance that, that has been set forth. So GDPR, think of it as um, if you think that we have it rough on the compliance and regulatory side, do a little research into the GDPR. You'll find that we actually have a pretty easy uh, those guys are, are doing way more to protect uh, private and confidential uh, information. Um, they're also doing way more to uh, ensure uptime of critical systems and infrastructure. So 2016 was a pretty big year for um, people not complying and then having to pay the piper. Um, I've literally, if you go out and do a Google search for 2016 FINRA fines, you're going to get plenty of pages that will show you all kinds of crazy fines that were, that were sent out. However, um, I picked a few out here to talk about. So on the, the HIPAA side, 
Um, there's the uh, Advocates Health received the largest HIPAA fine ever of $5.5 million. Now, $5.5 million, that sounds like a fair amount. However, that is the tip of what I think will become a big um, revenue source for, for HIPAA and for our federal government. Um, this is the beginning of, of people getting fined for not complying and losing patient data. And $5.5 million, it was actually, I believe this one, this was one that started out quite a bit higher and it was negotiated down to 5.5. However, in my opinion, from my research and then talking to the, the hospitals and clinics that we have as customers, um, they all tell me and they all feel like 2016 was the beginning of the fines for HIPAA. Um, Non-compliance 2017 is going to be even more. So if you're interested in watching the news and, and finding out who's, who's being fined, 2017, I think, I think what you're going to see is uh, uh, HIPAA having a lot more teeth going down the road. Um, PCI compliance, again, PCI is one of those very popular compliance. A lot of companies have to comply with this. Uh, uh, PCI, again, is a payment card industry. It basically is there to, to say um, if you're going to accept um, uh, credit cards online, you're going to have to follow these policies and procedures, and all those policies and procedures are intended to optimize the security, debit, uh, debit and cash card transactions. All that means, if you're going to take someone's credit card over the phone or over the wire, you've got to make sure that that is encrypted in transit and once it lands on your servers, the, the servers that are responsible for processing the order, you got to make sure that it doesn't go beyond that, that you don't lose that data. Because if you do, guys like Gensco were fined $13.3 million for a data breach. How is it that if somebody else breaches your environment and takes your data, you can get fined? That is what the PCI is all about. P Gensco said, hey, we are in compliance, we passed our audit, and yet we were breached and the uh, organization stole millions upon millions of customer records, and they were then fined $13.3 million. So that is a big one for PCI. Um, FINRA has always been an absolute you know, um, d disaster waiting for, to happen for people who don't comply with FINRA. FINRA, again, it's not, it's not our, our country's government. It is a nonprofit organization that is there uh, to go after people who wrongfully um, use financial systems for their own gain. Um, various corporations um, all over the place. This, this is one of those ones where you could soak up an entire day doing a search on the latest FINRA fines. Um, but various corporations have been, fa have been fined up to $14.4 million for failing to protect records. What do we mean by failing to protect records? Again, not holding on to the security of the private and confidential information of their users. Um, if I'm Wells Fargo and I'm collecting, you know, hundreds of thousands of social security numbers and their debit card numbers and their account numbers and their transaction history, and I all of a sudden lose that because I didn't follow um, what FINRA has told me to follow for data compliance, you're going to get a fine. And so 14.4 14, 14 million, not a small number. Um, Here's another one from PCI. Who here remembers the Ashley Madison uh, scandal that hit last year? Well, PCI came out and they <laughs> they, um, they fined the owners of Ashley Madison $17.5 million. In arbitration, it got bumped down to 1.6. That's, that's a pretty big jump from 17.5 to 1.6. However, Ashley Madison went through the PCI certification process. They had that little flyer on their wall that says that they were PCI compliant, and in fact, they were not. And it was found that, that they were not because the, the way that the people, the way that the uh, cyber terrorists, cyber intruders came in and took their data was within the means that um, PCI should have controlled. So that is why they were fined 17.5. They actually ended up paying 1.6. Um, these are just a tiny snippet of what's going on out there in the world for people getting fined. Um, again, if you have some free time, check it out. 2016 was a big, big year for compliance fines. Okay, so where do we take this? We've got all of this, this acronym soup of compliance. We've got all these penalties that are, are enforced upon people if they don't comply and if they don't pass audit or they do pass audit and then get exposed. Um, but when we look at the finer details of what compliance is actually asking for, it's actually not that complicated. Getting past acronym soup, they're asking for business continuity. Um, compliance is asking for data security. Uh, they're asking some organizations to hold on to data for a long period of time so they can so they can go resurrect it and look at it and pull it for whatever whatever reason in the future. So data retention is a big part. 
Um, almost all of them have a component of auditing. Some force you to prove your system is secure. Some tell you to just um, show that it's secure through a, a, a lot simpler audit trail. So these are what we here at Quorum have come up with, the four pillars of compliance. Again, business continuity, it's talking about data has got to be available at, uh, during a crisis. Not just data, but systems. We go back to that, uh, the electrical grid example. And if I'm an owner of a power grid in the southeast, I need to make sure that if I'm compromised, either from a cyber intrusion, a natural event, or a man-made event, that my customers can still stay online until I access what I'm delivering to them. That's business continuity. A lot of compliance out there is forcing people to make sure that they do business continuity planning, DR planning, DR testing, uh, installing secondary sites. So business continuity on that four pillars, that is a big one. Another big one is what happens to data as we collect it. Well, as we collect data, it's sitting on a database somewhere in our application or a, a subset of, of different databases, regardless of how it's set up. Data security um, implies that if you're going to collect my personal data, you're going to be forced to make sure that you do your best to make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. PCI is the big one here. Um, data has got to be protected against a breach. You've got to follow not just best, best practices. You have to follow the regulations that dictate you got to have a firewall, you got to have a, a backup disaster recovery solution, you've got to encrypt in motion and at rest. Um, for example, um, some, uh, there's been some talk that PCI may alter some of their plans to say, all right, if you're not only collecting data, you also have to um, have your backup solution encrypt data at rest and in motion as well. Uh, the thought being there, if you're making a literal copy of your customer data, uh, that copy um, also has to be encrypted and secured. Uh, data retention, SOX. Again, SOX is that compliance rule that came about uh, during the Enron scandal years. Um, they went back and they tried to find all these emails and financial uh, transaction history amongst these executives, and it was just deleted. It was gone. And so one of the things that Sox came along, Sarbanes and Oxley came along, is they said, all right, if you're going to be in this world, in the financial world, doing trades and, and holding deposits for other organizations, you're going to have to hold all of your transaction history, all of your messaging for years and years and years. That's nothing new. Data retention has been around for a long time. However, Sox actually put some teeth to it and forced people to actually invest in archiving. Um, we in the data protection world, we call it long-term storage or archiving. However you want to put it, it's the rule that says you've got to have us, you've got to hold your data for X amount of years for, for retrieval. And finally, audit trail. That's the last pillar that we came up with. Audit trail meaning if I am being forced to hold a secondary copy of my entire infrastructure at a different data center. Auditing is going to force you to turn it on and verify that users can actually access your system. So testing is an absolute critical, critical component towards passing um, a lot of compliance audits. So when we look at what compliant, what regulatory compliance is asking us to do, again, business continuity, data security, data retention, and audit. You know what? The IT directors that we that we talk to um, to come up with this research, it's not really all that different from internal expectations. And what are internal expectations? Well, if I'm a data center guy or an infrastructure guy, a sysadmin, sysengineer, whatever role you're holding, you're probably being told and you probably know that it's a good idea that your systems have to maintain um, availability. They've got to be online regardless of failure. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with a drive failure, a SAN failure, a site failure, a a host failure, it doesn't matter what the issue is, you got to have a solution that allows you to maintain uptime. That's one of those core tenets of, of infrastructure demands. Uh, it's a great idea to have a level of multiple layers of security. Um, we've been working this week alone with customers who have been impacted by ransomware events, who have taken down, literally taken systems offline, um, and we've helped them get back online almost immediately. Um, and, and so the idea that customers or it's a good idea or it's general expectation that you have a, a layered security system and the ability to recover almost immediately from ransomware, that is one of those core tenets, again, that I feel like all of our customers told us that is incredibly important to us. We got to have our infrastructure in a way that it's built to be resilient towards outages 
It's built to be resilient towards things like crypto locker and various forms of ransomware. And then finally, no solution out there, no um, infrastructure out there is complete without testing. We all test. We all test before, we'll, a lot of us test before we do patches and upgrades. Um, a lot of us will test the latest and greatest uh, hypervisor update or um, sand that they're about to implement. They'll, they'll put it through a rigorous testing before they send it out into production. DR testing is no different. If customers, if our customers are, are going down the path of turning up a secondary site, um, testing is a, is a big component of this. Not only POC testing, proof of concept testing, but actually after the fact, testing the, the solution. So if you have an outage, you can get back up and running. So what do we find here? We, we found a, a lot of parallel lines here. Business continuity goes right along with maintaining uptime. Uh, data security goes right along with internal security expectations. Um, data retention is one of those things that a lot of customers, even if they're not forced to have, it's a nice to have. Imagine being able to recover not only data, but an actual decommissioned server from four years ago. What if you inadvertently decommissioned a server, server and it had critical data on it that you didn't know about? Um, a lot of people now are asking for longer term retention, even if they're not forced to. And then finally, auditing is the same as testing. Auditing, um, testing is literally a component of most audit um, success criteria. So what we see here is a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, similarities between what companies are being forced to do to, to, to comply and what they already internally expect to do. So let's get right down to some best practices. How do you stay compliant while meeting those ex expectations? I have listed out four here. However, we could go on and on. I've only got about 40 minutes, another 10 minutes or so. We could go on and on with some best practices. Here are the most common sense ones that I came up with. Protecting the integrity uh, by demanding encrypted storage and long-term retention. This just means that um, not only should your vendors pass, uh, pass the same compliance regulations or compliance expectations that you are forced to pass, but those internal expectations of encrypted drives, of encrypted storage at rest, encrypt, encryption in motion, um, and or long-term retention, those things should be paramount. Um, Number two, this is a big one, demand a quick RTO. What is RTO for those that don't know? Recovery time objective. It just means how long are you willing to be out? How long are you willing to, to have outages or, or downtime? Um, a lot of customers will say, you know what? An RTO of one hour is, would be really, really nice. Um, we here at Quorum, I, I don't want to drone on about our company, but we here at Quorum, um, RTO for us is more like no more than five minutes. So RTO demands, um, and, and frequent backup points are two things that you, th these are best practices. These, this is something that you should really focus on. Uh, the ability to maintain availability of critical systems and make sure that you have a system that's ready to take the place of a failed production system, system will not, not only help you pass compliance, but it'll also help your company as a whole to, to maintain availability of all of your systems. Um, and one thing to don't, don't forget about here is, um, this is something that compliance doesn't really talk about, but this is just a good idea from the infrastructure side. Your recovery solution had better match your production system in, uh, in, in the aspect of performance. And what do I mean by that? Customers are investing in um, SSD uh, SANs. They're investing in hyper-converged solutions that do, um, uh, that do um, pass through, which means VMs have direct access to compute. So basically, they're they're building out solutions that are that are running VMs at an incredibly incredibly high rate. Um, your backup recovery and DR solution had better match that. It had better run on Flash. It had better run using pa uh, pass through. Because if it doesn't, if you had to fail over to your solution, you would have really unpleasant uh, performance uh, problems. So three. Archiving should be part of BDR. It's always been frustrating to me in previous jobs. When I've been forced to archive data, I have to go out and find a different vendor. Uh, I, I'd have a backup vendor, I'd have a business continuity vendor, and then I'd have an archive vendor. That always frustrated me because to me, archiving and backups, they're essentially the same thing. It's just holding the backups for longer. So um, archiving should be one of those things where if you're dealing with a backup vendor, they should have archiving already embedded. 
Um, that's going to help you stay compliant with holding data, and it's also going to help you meet that internal expectation of being able to resurrect data or servers from years in the past. Finally, that audit trail demands that you test your solution. Um, I, I, I've, wrote, I've written down here, always be testing, which means pass your audits by leveraging the thorough testing abilities of your DR solution. There would be nothing better. We, we were told by an insurance underwriter up in New York once, he said, one of the best parts of passing his very lengthy audit was being able to have the audit, the auditor sit behind him while he spun up an entire replica of his entire environment. So we're talking, you know, multiple servers, multiple terabytes of data literally spun up with a single click where the auditor can say, yep, in fact, you have a DR solution that if your main site goes down, your customers will still be able to access your systems at, and by the way, we were able to build a solution that were, was able to uh, meet and or exceed the performance expectations. So these are some of the, the quick hit best practices uh, that we're talking about. So how do you meet compliance and infra infrastructure demands? Um, if you are in the market, if you're looking at a better way to provide backup and disaster recovery, business continuity, uh, demand a fast RTO, demand a short RPO. RPO is recovery point objective. How far in the past are you willing to lose data? You know, 15 minutes is good. Maybe an hour is, is, is not bad. But demand a very fast recovery time and amazing performance of your recovery solution. Uh, we live in an age now where um, any vendor out there should be able to give you a solution that can run your production environment on a backup system without impacting performance. If your backup vendor is not meeting your production performance, you, you're working with the wrong backup vendor. You should look elsewhere. Long-term retention has got to be native. Again, we live in this age where if we're backing up your data, we may as well hold it for as long as you tell us to hold it. So I personally believe that gone are the days of having a backup vendor and an archive vendor. Long-term retention should be together. They should be um, under the same umbrella of your vendor. Offsite replication is another one of those things where it's just easier done if one company does both local protection and helps you out with the replication. Um, I was in a previous role. I, I worked with a software only backup solution and I had to I had to then work with a completely different partner, which means a different SKU, a different contract, a different phone number to call when it doesn't work, um, to replicate my environment from point A to point B. That is, those days, in my opinion, those days should be gone. You should have one vendor that protects everything locally, allows you to spin up recovery nodes locally or, or VM clones locally, as well as uh, replicate your entire environment, make a copy of your environment off-site. That should be one company. And finally, there are so many regulations that are demanding encrypted data at rest and in motion. If your backups aren't encrypted in rest and at motion, then you are probably you, you should probably look for a different backup vendor. It should be native. It should be standard that all backup data, once it is collected, is immediately locked. And why is that? Well, let's again, let's throw out that ransomware idea. If your production systems are compromised by a, a variant of ransomware, most likely that variant is going to try and crawl to whatever it can reach on your network. Well, if it's touching your backup system and your backup system is encrypted and it says, no, you may not, you may not change me, um, you're going to be more likely to be able to fail over and recover from that ransomware event. This is common sense stuff here. The ability to back up your backup, or I'm sorry, encrypt your backup solution should be a core tenant, a core ability for any backup and recovery solution. Um, you should also be able to recover from any point in retention. What does that mean? That means that if I am backing up my servers 10 times a day and holding them for 40 days, I should be able to boot up a literal clone of that server from any point in my retention because we all know that we can inadvertently back up bad data. Let's say ransomware gets into my environment on a Monday at 10 o'clock. I backed it up for an entire day before we even realized that we were compromised. Um, your backup and recovery and business continuity solution should be able to go back to, let's say, the previous Friday or the previous Sunday where we have a known good state and run from there while you're cleaning out your ransomware infected uh, machines. Um, so let's talk very, very quickly about Quorum before we turn it over to uh, questions. At Quorum, everything is uh, extremely simple and fast. Uh, we do all NVMe-based backups. That just means we're back in Flash where we are recovering to Flash storage. We protect physical and virtual machines. 
we're going to protect not only the servers, but we, we do application consistent uh, backups of apps and data. Um, we are that single vendor that will get you that local HA um, uh, service, high availability, as well as replicating to your offsite or our cloud, which is called a DRAS service, disaster recovery as a solution. We are that one vendor that encrypts everything in motion and everything at rest standard. This is not an option. Um, we also have a native archiving. Uh, if you have archiving needs on day one, no problem. We have a solution for it. If you decide down the road that you want to hold data for longer, just tell us and we'll add that feature set. And then finally, our solution allows for unlimited local and DR testing, even in our cloud. We're making a copy of your environment, holding it in our cloud. You can do DR testing at any time with no extra charge, meaning no ingress, no egress network traffic. We're not going to charge you any additional compute charges if you're doing a DR test. And you can also run it as a test network uh, locally. That's the, that's the quick information about Quorum. We start out by protecting your environment with a physical appliance. Again, it's all running on NVMe cache. It's all running with 10 gig networking. So it's extremely fast backups, even faster recovery times. IOP numbers, if you're familiar with IOPs, are in the neighborhood of 25,000 IOPs per VM. We'll back up those physical and virtual machines and all SAN connected data and then make a copy of it that you can spin up anytime uh, at either your offsite or our cloud. Um, finally, with that, guys, thank you.